I haven't uh, I haven't written anything for percussion ensemble that it would be great to write something. So we just need to come up with like a clever title and then maybe an outline of like the things that we're going to talk about. This kind of music, <laughs> I you, you know I can't do this. <laughs> I just some people are born to go dang dang a day. That's what Barrett Deems used to say. Wow, wouldn't it be cool if if to compose a piece that we performed along with an ensemble, but but each of us, you and I, each composed a piece, and you're going to hear both of our creative expressions, right. That could be cool. That could be very cool. Then we'd have two little pieces of music to play. And maybe some, some, something in the composition that allows some looseness and improv. You know, so when they say drum solo, I just go. <laughs> <laughs> right. On radio broadcasts. That's what I do. I just, that's my drum solo. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, maybe we give ourselves some kind of parameters that we have both the same, same toys to work with, same tools. Kind of like what we did with the funny sound effects. We should just use that.
I mean, it, yeah, obviously we cool. would want the same instrumentation. That way the percussion ensemble doesn't have to change a bunch of stuff out. Um, yeah, yeah. So whatever, kind of, whatever it is, I, I want. I don't think it should be like killing either of us. Yeah, I, hope yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so many possibilities, you know. Listen. Well, let okay. So this let this be known. It's our first meeting. We've accepted it. We're going to accept with Pasic. I think the things that are going to be interesting, like the reason I would want to go see something like this, is I'd want to know that it's not impossible to write a piece of percussion ensemble music that you're going to sound i mean when you write your thing you, it's going to sound like you it's going to sound like the things that you know and are interested in my things are they're going to be completely different i would imagine you'd probably fly in and stay here for maybe a four-day span where we could rehearse with the ensemble after they've gotten everything together and hopefully yeah, they'd be awesome. they'd be ready to film after you know 10 hours of rehearsal or something with us right you know, two right. nice solid days of rehearsal, and then, and that will, and we'll document that. So we'll document that process. I'm going to have to stretch outside of my comfort zone. You may have to stretch outside of your comfort zone as we learn to navigate these things, and then we have to pull it off. Right. I like the idea, and I think the, like I said before, I think the important thing is that we, we don't leave it to the last minute to do which I'm right. really good at doing. I will put it <laughs> off until it's like two days and I've, okay, now it's time to write because we want to document the journey. Right. I think that's what will, uh, will legitimize our presentation. Um, so what Mark and I are going to try to do is journal our journey in composing getting the, the music to you, having the ensemble rehearse, Mark flies in, we, you know, spend two days with you rehearsing with a group maybe and, mm -hmm. and recording. So, and then we'll just try to reflect the whole way, like journal it in video style. And then I'll try to edit it together so we can kind of give an idea of what's it like to start a, with a blank slate and have to produce two pieces of music, you know, and, rehearse it, film it, record it, all that stuff. So it's kind of like cool. the journey that, that yeah. I think is going to be the interesting part. Um, we were thinking it would be fun if we, we decided that it would be cool if neither of us hear anything of the other person's until we're complete. Oh, wow. That's cool. But we yeah. wanted to pick some parameters. So we had the same tools to work with. And with obviously the first parameter would be the instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So we thought maybe you could present us with the instrumentation that you feel is maybe the strongest with your 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 ensemble. I don't know. You probably don't even know what students are gonna you're gonna have in the fall. I'll get um, an idea real soon. It'll all be finalized with probably by June first. Yeah. Yeah, and you know I would love from our perspective. I mean we're so honored to be involved in this thing. Um, the more experience the students can have performing with you guys, the, the better experience for us. We should talk about, just for a minute, where we're at with our compositions. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I haven't written anything yet, but... I actually... Yeah, you know, I keep coming up with all these excuses of like, I've got all these other things I need to do first. Or I'll forget. Right. And then, you know, four or five days will pass. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is going to get here right. before we know it. So we're kind of getting into the the red zone a little bit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's my neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Have you had any luck yet with starting? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, as a matter oh, good. of fact, I'm just getting used to the fact that I have all these mallet instruments and trying to figure out how to orchestrate stuff and and also how to showcase us and what to do rhythmically, you know. Right. Like I'm used to writing tunes and thinking about the drums last. And now it's a drum feature. So it's like, oh, okay, let's see. Well, what can we do? Maybe some, some hip unisons and then maybe some trading and then 
some weird interlocking stuff, you know. But but at the same time, I'm like, okay, is this melody going to hold up? Is this harmony going to hold up with two drummers, like, going for it? Lately, I've been uh, just, you know, drooling on the piano, as Ralph Tanner would say, and then just writing stuff uh, in a sketch, like a finale sketch, just writing random ideas, and then later transferring those to specific sections. But for this tune, um, what I did was, you know, I worked a lot with this guy, Mike Michael Philip Mossman, and he's a, he's a trumpeter, and he's done a lot of scoring for a big band and stuff, and I've worked with him a lot. Like, I actually first worked with him. He used to live in Chicago for a minute, and we played together with Howard Levy when I was really young in my 20s. And um, then later we worked together in New York when I moved there, and then we wound up working with some of the radio bands in Germany. And he wrote this article called Big Band Arranging One, Two, Three. And so he said, you know, uh, instead of just tearing your hair out trying to write a score, get out an index card and answer the following questions, like who is it for, blah, 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 you know, what, who is the featured instruments? And then he's got this whole thing. So I mapped out completely what the form is going to be for this piece. And I put it in a finale file like a couple of days ago. And so now I'm just messing around with stuff. And I, and I always go back to, uh, like I put it in, uh, you know, notes on the mm -hmm. Mac. Yeah. I just made a sheet like, okay, this is going to be the A section. This is going to be the B section. This is going to be the vibe. And so I'm trying to just like paint by numbers, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it's probably going to work out, you know? I mean, uh, just trying to, and of course, I, 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 everything is subject to change and that's fine. It doesn't have to be ultimately as I initially wrote it down. But I'm trying it this way just to see how that works, you know. Yeah, right. Uh, because if I if, if somebody says it gives me a descriptor, you know, like okay, this section needs to be exciting and feature, you know, some drum trades. Okay, I can write something like that. Boom. Okay, this section has to be harmonically hip and have more of a relaxed feel, like maybe a longer harmonic rhythm and lasts around 16 bars. Okay, I'll mess around with some chord progressions. So at least I have an idea of what it, you know, but at the same time, I can't really force it. I kind of have to let it be what it wants to be. So if it's going to go off the rails, I'll just follow it and see what happens and then try yeah. and bring that into the picture, you know, somehow. I mean, I, it's, it's so strange that, you know, every day I would write a little bit of something and then forget about it. And the next day I would write something and just forget about it every day, every day, every day. And then suddenly that I just sat down and this piece just like came out. The whole thing came out all in one sitting. That's amazing. And now I'm in there, you know, kind of, and I did it all in Ableton. So everything is just MIDI. It's just like a song. Yeah. And I'm now in there tweaking little things and making little decisions. Jim, do you, I've been attracted to this sound and it sounds like people are clicking sticks. And I was wondering, is there some kind of like bamboo that's like split that when you click them together, it has like kind of a big open kind of, yes, I, you know, it doesn't just sound like two pieces of wood. It has more. Yeah. That I've written that sound into my piece. That sound isn't, I just like that sound with like four people doing different rhythms with it. Write whatever you want, and that's the cool thing about, you know, being a percussionist, right, is <laughs> you got to, like, <laughs> interpret what these crazy composers write <laughs> right. and make it happen. That's that's fun for me. Uh, do you guys have any other questions that would, that would hold you up from writing, like kind of like Rich's question about <laughs> instruments or, I mean, write it as hard as you want, you know, whatever you think of, write, you know, and that goes for improv speed chops vocabulary whatever you know 
Okay. Mine doesn't have any yeah. of that. <laughs> <laughs> Vocabulary. <laughs> Improv. <laughs> It's called unison dependence. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> my piece is, I think my piece is done. I've tried to sit on it and change it. And I went in and tweaked everything like three days ago. And, and my wife is like, it sounds like an arrangement of a pop song. For percussion ensemble and it lost its vibe so you know i was i was real concerned with i've got to have the chords cool and i've got to have all this stuff that mu musicians will appreciate and and then when it came down to it i'm like you know it's just what came out in the creative moment is just the vibe of that moment that happened so i reverted all the way back to like my original idea and i'm like this is this is the piece, you know. If there's a different piece later that needs to be written, that, that will happen. But I feel like I was like trying to over edit from from here instead of here. For sure. You know? Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting process to to second guess yourself for intellectual reasons. I'm heading to O'Hare Airport. Uh, Mark Walker is flying in today to spend the weekend, and this is the day that we unveil, we reveal our compositions to each other, and uh, and then we're going to go down and meet with the Vandercook Percussion Ensemble, and then meet with Jim Yakis, who's the uh, the uh, the head of the percussion department down there and the director of the percussion ensemble. Um, so we are rolling. We are in the next phase of this thing. Um, up until now, it's just been like, let's try to get these things written. But we are officially going to hear each other's pieces in just about an hour. Hey, hey. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to town. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. Thank you. Jay. First. Uh, uh, yeah, if you want to play mine first, that's fine. Let's get it out of the way. <laughs> yeah, see here. Yeah, come on down. I'll hear it later. No, no, it's fine. No, no, I'll hear, I'll hear them later. No, I mean, I've heard yours, but I want to. I'm going to listen later. No, it's I know he's working on it still. His face. She knows it's half, no, no. half baked. So That's what you should call it. I'm, half baked. <laughs> I'm so. No, no, no. I asked him yesterday, he was. Out of time. Time's, Time's up. up. Time's up. Time's up. <laughs> like, okay, this is it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Already we have someone who refuses to listen to it. I know, come on. <laughs> no, it's okay. Right. It's just arbitrary you know, stuff. Wow, man. That was really, really good. Thanks. I appreciate Dang. it, man. The idea was 1964, 65, we lived in London because my mom was from there. And um, I, we, it took me to Battersea Park, which is an amusement park. And I brought this little train. It's the end of the spring and the spell. It's like, yeah, this is cool. We, you know, riding trains are ringing bells. And uh, now I'm still doing it. Right. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> so that was the feeling with what it would be like. Like the little kids seeing all this insane stuff for the first time. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah let's go. Let's go. Let's go on this ride. Got that feeling. So that's why there's so much, like, it, seemed, I, it struck me like a, something that Ralph Towner said about composition. You, know, you should never, it shouldn't be like you dumping all your candy on the table. You should put it like, but I, in this one, I just went, wow. There's a lot of candy on the table. 
<laughs> but it's so great. I mean, that's exactly the, what I imagine. Yeah. All right, man. Very right. awesome. Very awesome. Thank you. stuff starts okay. um if she's super into it and like good at it then i'm cool she's good at it my concern is a five big turnaround with that much footage that's a lot of footage. that's why you're saying maybe we can yeah. do some stuff before get it done before then oh well, some of that but like you know the Just, more she knows about the piece the easier it's going to be for her to film right if you could sub out if you don't have any commitments on wednesday morning then maybe you could even fly out Tuesday night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we could even rehearse Wednesday morning, play for the kids here Wednesday afternoon. So should we play something to, I mean, how, what do you want to do? How do you want to kind of uh, the next hour? Well, let's see. Uh, maybe you could show me what the drumming is on YouTube, like what, what's involved. I've never even played it yet, so. Some stuff like kind of with that in mind, like if there's a there's vamp in one key, that might be that you know that might be that groove. So I'm thinking, okay, along those lines. And I wrote some figures like so like a funk, right? Okay, jazz. yeah, cool, nice. Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, there will probably be just like bass playing and marimba solo and us just jamming, sort of like you know weather report style cool thing. okay so it looks like we have really nine rehearsals until mark flies in which isn't a lot <laughs> rich yeah. even if you you know if we're starting this thing tuesday if you wanted to hop on right where you are we have that huge screen in room 130 i could just say hey it's rich he's going to talk about the piece <laughs> oh yeah we're virtual we're on awesome so I just wanted to give you a little overview of what this piece is about and what drum mantra in general is about. Um, because all the pieces that I compose, I compose a bunch of pieces that become play alongs for exercises under uh, my uh, online education program called Drum Mantra. Um, and a lot of the qualities that you'll be doing in, in your parts in this piece are reflective of all the things that we work on in this drum set program that I've created. And the concept of drum mantra is to do um, repetitive exercises to develop muscle memory is kind of the, the foundation of it. Just a general basic great idea of practice is to do a practice long enough so your body starts to memorize the motions of whatever it is you're doing. And the, the exciting part about the drum mantra is it starts to incorporate polymeters, polymetric relationships. Polymetric relationships are not polyrhythms. Polymeters and polyrhythms are two different things. Uh, a polyrhythm is two different groupings of notes that have different subdivisions, but they re resolve in the same amount of time. So you might have, you know, maybe an eighth note triplet, and then above it, you could have a five note grouping that, that happens in the same amount of time as that eighth note triplet. That's a polyrhythm. Those are 
two different groupings of notes with different subdivisions that resolve in the same amount of time. A polymeter is different groupings of notes with the same subdivision that resolve at different times. So you have to play a cycle of these things for them to come back to the beginning of the, of the, of the bar or of the, of the pattern. This is the premise of the whole concept of the five to four polymetric relationship is you play quarter notes in one hand, and then you play every fifth, sixteenth note in the other hand. Now the, the, the formula for this is downbeat, and then beat two, you'd be on the E, which is, you know, one sixteenth note later, which gives you five. Beat, beat three would be the and, and beat four would be the uh, and there'd be nothing on beat five. So it'd be one, two E, three and four, a uh, five. That's a really important pattern to get, and you should try to get it both directions. One, two E, three and four, a uh, five. It's a coordination thing. Two E, three and four, a uh, five. The next step to this is you would you would count to five with your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then you'd also count with your with your left hand. You'd count to four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now here's the interesting thing about polyrhythms and polymeters. If I'm counting to four with my left hand and thinking of those as quarter notes, my right hand is playing a polyrhythm with it. If I'm thinking 16th notes is the subdivision and the quarter note is in my right hand, then it's a polymeter. I'm not gonna go down that huge rabbit hole, which is what drum mantra is all about, but uh, I just wanted to give that little, little snippet into, a little insight into how this piece is structured. This is all about accuracy. The, the piece itself is not that challenging. Um, it's, it's very uh, ostinata oriented. So once you get your little part of the, of the music down, you will just stick on that little part. That's the other part of drum mantra. Mantra is kind of like a meditation. It's something that you say over and over and over and over and over again. So your parts are kind of like meditation. So once you have your part, you just stay on it. And then you can enjoy how the interaction is happening with everyone else because everyone is staying on their own part. You get to kind of see how all these pieces lock together. It was really interesting. This piece just happens to be 108 measures long. And when I said that to my wife, she immediately said, Joppa. I was like, what does that mean? She says, Joppa is the act of using the meditation beads in you know, in Buddhism or even uh, Catholics have it too. The rosary has 108 beads. The the Buddhists have uh, uh, a mala bead, which is 108 beads. So when they do their meditations, they count each bead. It's 108 beads. And I was like, wow, this piece is 108 measures long. And so the word is J-A-P-A. -A, so I changed the spelling to, uh, you know, be a little bit clever, but that's the reason it's named Japa. That means uh, focusing on the meditation of the 108 cycles of, of a meditation. Um, yeah. Can I put you back on and we'll do those exercises with you, the five with four, and, you know, you can count it off and we'll all do it on our leg, you know, do it on the right side, do it yeah. on the left side. And that I like to think of every single piece, every single part to me is, is a melody. Like no one's playing a supportive role. Everyone is actually playing their melody. So no matter what you're doing, the listener can focus in on your part and enjoy everything that's going around at, and hear you as the lead instrument, no matter what your what part you're playing. So we visited the studio, and it's going to be great. Uh, what do you guys want to do with a click, or what do you think I should get these kids used to having in 
you know, playing with. I would definitely would yeah. like the kids to be able to play to a click. Right. Okay. Because we're, we're in the studio, we will definitely have a click. I'm heading down to Vandercook College to do a rehearsal with the percussion ensemble. You know, like you have to be so solid in your own part, it has to be second nature to actually listen around and see how it splits, you know? Right. Because right. if you're not, as soon as you do that, your part's not right. And then it starts to snowball, you know? So, yeah. And, and um, it only happens through lots and lots of repetition. Yeah. And kind of like, you know, what you're happen. doing, like, like mindful repetitions, right? Like sitting there and relaxing and thinking of it in larger groups instead of math and a bunch of zeros and ones going through your brain, you know? Yeah. Kind of like a drum mantra. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, man, shedding these pieces has been really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it What's it like? Up... <laughs> <laughs> and you guys didn't even plan this, but they are two totally different pieces, which is really cool. They're like, but they're making them such better musicians, just having to, you know, the, the character of the pieces are different. You know what I mean? Like Marx is more like a big band chart with all this, you know, and, and Rich's is this meditative groove thing you know and it's it's very cool yeah it's so cool that they ended up both so unique from each other you know yeah and you guys didn't even mean it center of the beat ready one Is there going to be a, a, a speaker in a room where we're practicing so we can turn a track on to work with? Um, I can see if I can make that happen. Okay. Okay, cool, cool man. Great, thanks so much, Jim. Uh, what's the ETA for you guys? 6.15. Okay, we'll see you in a bit. Okay. Cool, man. Until then. Bye. All right. Yeah. That sounded like an official phone call. All right. We're getting down to business. Woo, this is really happening. <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> Amazing, huh? Yeah. I mean, we, wow. I think. Like, I remember so many weeks of just, like, not knowing what to write and not knowing how to begin, yeah, you know? I know? And then all of a sudden, now we're here and we've got complete compositions. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. And when you put something into motion like what we did, you have to see it through. Like, right. We've commi we committed ourselves on a whim almost like a dare almost felt like it yeah like the yeah mechanic. like let's should we go for it yeah, yeah let's go for it Uh, we're gonna attempt to run your tune for the first time all the way through and then I'm gonna let them go. Cause they're...
the Vandercook College of Music building. The door will open soon. Yeah. Yes. All right. There's a harp. Corn oven mitt. <laughs> <laughs> Timbali, that's gonna be a Timbali. Those, uh, the... It'll be the... Uh, one E? One E of bar 81. So those two notes. ba da yeah. ba -da. Yep. It's like, yeah, man, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only, this, I mean, this can only happen if we're doing this. Right? Exactly, yeah. You know? Right. That's, and that's the beauty of it. Like uh, I was thinking for the first solo, you know, where it goes to that thing, get to 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 get that could be split up if it I mean if it doesn't sound too split up. What's your mid rehearsal update? Oh my goodness. Um, my question for you, Rich, was, so the, your piece, Joppa, it's kind of, it's similar to a lot of other percussion ensemble literature. It's got just the keyboard instrumentation vibes and marimba, and it's got the drum set going, but you also have all the shakers and the clappers going on. And I was, we got the parts and looked at them, and they were like, clapper? But now it's really coming together. How did you decide on those textures and instruments for this? I 
I like the, uh, I especially like to hear just a, like it's a, just a piece of white noise, really. Yeah. You know, it's just like a staticky kind of white noise sound, different pitches. And I really like to hear it in when it's in the stereo field. So like if you have headphones on, you listen to the demo, they're placed sonically around you. So you start to feel these things popping out from different section, different areas of your mm-hmm. you know, hearing field. And I just like the randomness of it. I like the, 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 when you hear all of those together, it sounds like random kind of chaotic snaps and pops, but they're all, mm-hmm. they're all related, they're all interconnected. Yeah, I think that's cool, it really fits the vibe of the piece, and I really like what you said about the spatial stuff, because the piece like plays with time and your perception of it, and then having that element, super cool. I think that really fits into your vibe with like the drum mantra, like meditation yeah. stuff, just feeling it, because the more we play this piece, and the, the more we rehearse, and the more I listen, and the more I hear it come together, I'm hearing like different things, different patterns, like as the clappers are doing their thing. Like, we, we were rehearsing and we looped that um the section at O, like with the eighth notes and then the three against four, I think it's O, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. that like metric uh-huh. breakdown. And we looped it for like 10 minutes. We're just yeah. sitting there and like, as I'm playing it, I, I, I took time listening to each person and just feeling like the weird like overlaps and connections going on there it was super cool. So it's like you have these, what I call rhythmic perception where you can, like if you take a four, three, and a five, that's three, five, three, four, and five. Mm-hmm. If you can, if you can program that into something, because it's really hard to play mm-hmm. and do this, but if you can program it in, and then you listen to it from the quarter note perspective, and how do these other two things interact with the quarter note? Mm-hmm. What you find out is there's 16th note subdivisions, so you have three, three 16th note groupings and five 16th note groupings interacting with a four 16th note grouping, the quarter note. And then you shift your perception and you start hearing the dotted eighth note as the main pulse. Now, how are these, how is the four and the five interacting? Because now, if the eighth note is actually the pulse, then you're actually listening to triplets because it's three notes per pulse. So now you're in, are you in 12 eight, are you in 15 eight? And so those are dancing around, and you start to hear how they act as triplets, and then you finally shift it to the five-note pulse as the pulse. And now the subdivision is five subdivisions between each pulse, which I call the 20th note. So in 4-4, you have 20 of them. Yeah. Five between each pulse. So they're not quarter notes anymore. They're the subdivision called the 20th note to, to me. And then, ha- and then are you able to hear how those threes fall across that field of, of 20 notes per measure. Mm-hmm. It takes three measures for, the, for that to resolve. So it's like you can, you can start to take a very simple little idea, like three, four, and five together, and you look at it from these different perspectives, and it totally opens up your, the world of something. I mean, your brain has changed. Yeah, yeah. When, when you start to, <laughs> so that is the drum mantra. Yeah. Both of your guys' pieces kind of reflect your styles. With Rich, it's his drum mantra, his vibe. With Mark, it reminds me a lot of some of the stuff we did at Dave Percussion a few years ago and the stuff from your album, just groove-oriented jams or improv and solos. Did you guys, like, collaborate at all as you wrote these, or did you each wrote them independently and showed them, or what was the process like with that? Well, the idea was that we would write something for percussion ensemble and wouldn't tell each other what mm-hmm. it was. So whatever it was going to be, it was going to be. It would have been totally freaky if we had written something really similar, but mm-hmm. happily, I could say we've written something totally different. Mm-hmm. And so it's really, like, like, like Jimmy Acker said, it's a big band chart. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, I'm glad it turned out the way it did. I'm really happy with, I mean, the last night was the first night I heard it, mm-hmm. played by real instruments. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's wow. It's cool feeling, isn't it? And, you know, thankfully, everybody I'm sure is relieved that the tempo's gonna be a little, <laughs> time's not at that up, it's gonna be a little bit down. <laughs> <laughs> now, it just grooves more. What's, now this might be different between you, but what's your process for writing the actual drum set part? Are you sitting there in finale just notating each note? Do you sit down and groove for a while and see what works with the track? What's how's that work? Well, for me, I, you know, like 
everything was about running out of time, so that's why I called it Time's Up. Yeah. But uh, so I had to send off some version of it, and I just sat down on drums and then just played a quick and dirty demo and sort of conceived it as I was doing it. I maybe did like try it a couple of times and then mm -hmm. just send it off. And so uh, I knew I had to. I knew I had to create a part for Rich, otherwise, like, what's he gonna play? So I basically kind of remembered what I had played without listening to it and just notated a part in finale, like, okay, this would sound good. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of like what I would do. And basically, we're both playing that part. Does it feel so, weird playing someone else's, like, drum set part? Like, does it feel... It's so cool. I mean, it's just like when you transcribe somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in college transcribing a 16 bar thing of Jack Dejanette and all of a sudden oh, you're like I yeah. understand how Jack thinks mm -hmm. now you know because mm -hmm. you you hear the phrasing and you hear the shape of how things actually happen you know and, and this is a, a, a great glimpse into how Mark thinks mm -hmm. because I can feel it it's very I said it last night there's some of these Markisms in the groove and <laughs> right, right. how things happen and how the fills work yeah, it's totally. I mean, you can't. I don't think you can help but write like you who you are. Yeah, it, right. it, it's your own like touch and right. style. Yeah. Now, was his process similar to what you did with your piece, or was it was it different at all? Uh, very different. Yeah, I think so. I think I, when I think of Mark's music, I think linear. I think like this is a piece of music that's going to carry you through. There's sections. My pieces feel more like they're modular. Mm -hmm. Like you could take any section of my piece and loop it, and everyone would have an experience. Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like because the rhythms are repetitive and polymetric, they kind of fold in on each other. So my music, I always feel like has this this kind of feel to it, where Mark's music has this kind of feel to it. Like you're going down the track. The whole concept of this, I was thinking. Uh, was when I was about four years old. We lived in London for about a year or so because my mom's mom was born there. Me mom. Uh, <laughs> and they took me to an amusement park and I rode this little train and I was ringing this bell and it was like one of the happiest moments of my life. So that's, you know, being on a track and ding, boom, boom. <laughs> right, right. All right, Mark, time's up. We got to go. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> So yeah, that's that kind of thing. But there's 284 like, more bars to go, Mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just getting started. <laughs> that was the first time I played percussion, too. Was your process for your drums up part about the same, or since your piece is very like metric-oriented and with all that, were you like sitting down and like thinking, how can I mess with this feel? No, was... no I kind of coined this, this, you know, the word drum mantra kind of became sort of the overarching definition of a certain way of playing which is repetitive polymetric coordination kind of exercises mm -hmm. so the way that we were rehearsing it last night when we got to a certain letter I said this is the peak of the drum mantra like this is the height of everything that he and I are going to do to interact together and it's and it's a drum mantra like you could sit on it and play it for a long time and, and and that's what we had to do last night. Yeah. yeah. But the way it fits together when it's really locking and it's flowing, it's yeah. very cool. That's how it feels when we're playing it too, just yeah. getting that in. Yeah. Right. I think I come up with the idea of like, what is what is the groove and then kind of maybe compose around that idea mm -hmm. sometimes. Well, like, we're going to have this five against four hi-hat going the whole time. We're going to see what we can fit into that through the whole thing. Yeah, well, when I think of five, I automatically think, okay, you can put four evenly spaced notes in the measure of five. Mm -hmm. And that's a great rhythmic vehicle right there, because you have two different potential pulses happening together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, take four. Take four. <laughs> <laughs> It's all an experiment, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's every time you write a piece of music, you discover something new about yourself, and you realize your music is just your music. I mean, it's just. And it was such a great contrast. I yeah. Mean, and and your piece is like, oh man, that's going to be some serious shedding work. Right. I think it's cool because both pieces, <laughs> like, we we love both of them, and they're both really good examples of just how you can integrate this drum set stuff into the percussion ensemble. Like, 
completely different styles, but it still works and grooves each way. I think that's a really cool just testament to how that can work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're now downtown Chicago at the Chicago Recording Company, CRC, loading in for tomorrow's session with the Vandercook College Percussion Ensemble. Taylor, what about our timpani? I'll come back. No, you won't. That's all. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get in the Everybody elevator with everybody. Oh, yeah. What a day we've had. What a two days we've had. <laughs> Let's see, Smashing Pumpkins over here. So Lady Gaga. Madonna. Ooh. Oh, wow. All right, yeah. here we are. Um, you're in? Okay. Weeder, I didn't know you were going to be here tonight. Oh, I got to set this shit up, man. Somebody's got to do it. Oh, oh man. Yay. I ain't coming at I 6 in the morning I to know. do I was this. Like, I was like, man, he's going to have a lot of work tomorrow morning. Fuck that. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here. Me we're, too. We're live. Hi. How's it going? Steve Weeder, my favorite engineer in Chicago. Right here, baby. We got the best. Rock. Yes. Right. You know, we're documenting this whole thing. We yeah. have film crew come in tomorrow. So. Yep. We're gonna, we're gonna, Should uh, be cool. documenting this part too. Uh, yo, yo. <laughs> cool. Cool. You think there's somewhere it, where we should put Jonathan? our Jonathan? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We met good Rich. You, yeah. yeah, good to see you. Okay, I'll Very walk you through and give you a tour. <laughs> we're thinking, oh, yeah, so we were thinking about facing, I'm gonna go ahead and get record all this. We were thinking of facing each other, and I kind of, are you cool with that idea about the sure. kind of stereoing us? So you got have one of us on one side, I one was on the totally other. Totally thinking that. Yeah. 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 Doing a, yeah. Because some of our parts we've c created, so things yeah. are bouncing back and forth That's between us and stuff. What I was thinking. Okay. So it should be. Yeah. But do you want to have enough space between us to put a gobo, or a little a wall or anything, or are we just going to be Maybe. in that room? Maybe I'm going to let you guys set up, and then I'm going to. How much space do you Figure want between our bass drums? Uh, probably like you know, just like six just feet would be cool. Okay, social distancing. Yeah, there, there distancing. you go. Six <laughs> feet. Okay. <laughs>
night, it's almost 3 a.m. <laughs> the night of the day session. <laughs> yeah, got to the studio at 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's now 2.45 <laughs> in the morning the next day. <sighs> it's a long day and a lot oh. of the challenging things to deal with. But some very interesting things happened too, you know. Yeah. We discovered the importance of practicing and Yeah, that's I think that's the biggest thing that's kind of been the theme for me for the last couple of years is you know, have an idea and see it all the way through. Yeah. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> You're three hours into it already. Yeah, man. Of which we recorded probably for two. <laughs> <laughs> it was an adventure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I was just saying, this is one for the books. I don't know what books, but this is one for the books. Right. Well, we'll have some sort of memory of it in a bit in the yeah. form of the video. <laughs> It's gonna be great. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mark Walker here, and I'd like to give you a little lesson on orchestration and contrast. What does that mean? Well, when we recorded my tune, Time's Up, we were basically playing the same drum parts because I had only written one drum part. And I thought when we got together, we could work out some different contrasts and different things we could do. So one of the parts was in a vamp section in the middle of the tune, which was sort of in a rock fusion feel, kind of like this. So rather than play the exact same thing, as cool as that sounds, I decided to come up with a contrasting part. And what I did was I took a hand percussionist approach. So I used cross stick sounds, rim shot sounds, kind of muffled rim shot sounds, toms, a timbale, and eventually I worked in a cowbell. So the part I played was inspired by the great Cuban drummer, Ignacio Berroa. And he played on uh, many albums, including Bata Cumbele, Un Poco del Songo from 1980. And that was the Puerto Rican group that uh, kind of followed in Los Van Van's footsteps in certain ways, but really had their own sound. So this groove that he played was a songo groove, but it was a kind of a used for a breakdown section. So basically, what you're doing is, if you're looking at it in 16th notes, you're playing quarter notes with a cross stick. And then you're filling in the other notes with the right hand on the muffled snare. But sometimes Ignacio will put in a bass drum for the last note instead of a snare accent. So it would sound like this. See how that sounds like songo? Kind of like the groove that Changuito developed. So uh, what you can also do when you play that groove
you can move a note, which would be the 1E out of 2E out of 3E out of 4E, or 2E. And then the way I decided to uh, extend that a little bit was to start putting those three notes together on different toms. So it sounded like this. So the melodic possibilities came into play, and that was kind of like what a conga player would do. And uh, so I decided on the spur of the moment, as we were recording at uh, probably two in the morning, uh, to just move the stick over a little bit because I had a cowbell mounted on the bass drum hoop. And when I hit that cross stick on the cowbell, I get a cowbell sound as well. So it's kind of cross between a, a cowbell sound and a cross stick sound. If you want to make it ring, you can just play a full stroke, come off of it. Or you can play a dead stroke where you just stay on it. I think I did a combination of different strokes, but mostly stayed on it. So if you take that and combine it with what we just had, it sounds like this. So when you hear the actual tune, you'll hear me doing that and Rich playing the first groove that I played. And I thought that came out pretty nice. So uh, enjoy that. The sticking is basically left hand on the downbeats and everything else played by the right. Sometimes the bass drum would come and it would usually come on the uh of the beat. And everything else is just filling in with the right hand. So have fun with it and enjoy the tune.